In Pit Lane is proudly brought to you by DinoTech by Dino Dynamics. For your nearest workshop, visit our website. And with the support of the Ramada Resort, Phillip Island. We're here in the luxuriously appointed Cam's boardroom with the brand new CEO of the Confederation of Australian Motorsport, a man who'd be well known to a lot of you, but not in terms of his motor racing time, but with his time with AFL football at both the Collingwood and North Melbourne football clubs. Eugenia Rocker, welcome to Winpit Lane and welcome to Motorsport. Thank you very much for having Now, if you can tell us, uh, how did you get the job? Um, I got a phone call out of a blue from someone who was obviously entrusted to find a CEO and uh, was asked whether I was interested in applying and I said I was and literally two weeks later I had the job. So it moved, or maybe two and a half weeks later, it moved fairly quickly but I was approached to uh, throw my hat in the ring, uh, certainly wasn't guaranteed any outcome and I thought it was something that I was very interested in. When Cam's put out the press release regarding your appointment, they did point out that you had uh, an interest in motorsport. Tell us a bit about that. Well, apart from having owned about 15 cars over the journeys from Beamers to Audis to Alphas um, to Holdens and Fords, um, I'd probably been to about eight GPs in Adelaide. It almost became a ritual with me and my mates from Faulkner and Reservoir. We'd drive over to Adelaide and uh, watch for GP and then when it came to Melbourne, obviously went to the first four or five and then started to go to some of the V8s, particularly at the Gold Coast. So... You would call me a very keen observer, and uh, but if you asked me to pull a car apart and tell you where how it all works, I couldn't do that. And certainly my interest levels have increased um, uh, very, very much since I've been here at CAM. So I, I like motorsport. I like the F1s. Obviously, we've all watched them on TV and V8s. So I've got more than a passing interest. The interesting thing is, that coming from a football background, CAMS has obviously targeted you. What do you think that you bring to the dance that uh, you can transfer across from AFL football to, to motorsport? Um, I'm a passionate guy, and I think most people who know me know that I've become very passionate about things that I believe in, and that's always a, an advantage in sport. But I think my background in membership services and customer services with a healthy dose of commercial um, background... And also a lawyer, I guess it doesn't hurt to be uh, have that sort of background. All went into the melting pot, but uh, in the interviews it became very, fairly clear to me that my background in membership and customer services was something that they valued pretty highly. And uh, you know, being a, the biggest club in Australia at Collingwood and one of the smaller clubs uh, certainly uh, gave me an opportunity to engage at, at that level. Your appointment certainly made a made a big splash on people. I found out about it standing at a tram stop in uh, in Burke Street when somebody ran across the road and said, "Do you know Eugene Rocker is the new CEO of CAMS?" Um, and one of the things that that weekend, after we we had put it on our website and people were talking about it at Sandown that weekend, was a lot of people was, were very interested in that that membership. Uh, sort of work that you did at North Melbourne in returning control of North Melbourne to the members. Do you see a, a similar role here in CAMS to bring some of the, at least a feeling of uh, franchise back to the members, which a lot of them feel they've lost over the past decade or so? Um, if you look at the North Melbourne example, we essentially had uh, 10 or 11 people controlling 95% of a vote of a, of a football club. Uh, we, through engagement, communication, um, strategy um, and uh, talking to them about our plans were able to get those 12 people to hand their shares back for zero, having paid something like three million 20 years ago. Um, so I'm at, I've been at the upper end of trying to get a control back into the membership's hands and I value very much the one vote, the one, the one, the one man, one vote or one woman, one vote philosophy. So uh, from Cam's point of view, I think that background enhance my reputation to at least listen to what members have to say, try to help them in understanding how we operate and delivering back benefits. There are three things, you know, understanding where they're coming from, delivering back benefits, but also listening to them and communicating with them. So that background at North Melbourne in particular, as Collingwood's a different beast, you know, members are hanging off the walls. At North Melbourne, we increased membership in one year by 35%, um, 40% nearly as a record. I don't know that we need to do that at, Nor at CAMS, but we certainly need to listen to our members, engage with them, and uh, try to deliver back to them benefits that they probably haven't, haven't really had for some time. 
one thing I notice over the, the years of doing in pit lane, and I've been out to a lot of car clubs doing a lot of talks, and sometimes it's fairly scary to sit in the room and uh, ask people sort of, you know, who here was born before 1961 and suddenly realise that I'm, in fact, one of the youngest people in the room at the age of 51. Um, how do we attract... Is this part of your plan to try and attract more young blood into CAMs and into car clubs? Um, absolutely, and the demographic sort of anecdotally suggests that the over 50s are sort of make up a large proportion of membership at CAMS. Um, we don't have a junior CAMS membership as such, and I think that's something we should explore as the custodian of motorsport. Um, who better than CAMS to engage with kids from 12, 13, 14? I, there wouldn't be too many boys that don't have a model car in their room at 13 or 14, but somehow we lose them along the way. I think that I can bring some skills in, uh, in particularly from the football background, to create a mini um, Auskick. Um, it's very difficult when you don't have 800 players at your um, disposal, but I think there are things that we can do to get kids involved in motorsport. There wouldn't be a red-blooded male or female at the age of 14 who wouldn't love a spin in a V8 car. I know I wouldn't. I'm 52. So I think there's something that we can do to engage with those junior members and uh, give them real experience and give them a greater, a greater understanding of uh, motorsport. One thing that's been a criticism of, of a lot of people, including ourselves over the years, has been how CAMS has communicated both with their members and with the wider motorsport community. Certainly in our time of doing the program, we don't hear a lot out of CAMS. There's a lot of things that CAMS does that we never hear about until it's way too late. And we said, well, gee, we could have promoted that on the show or something. Is that something that you're going to look at to try and get this get the promotion out and, and have a better relationship with the media, which it's it's been fairly fractious over the past few years. The history is, is unfamiliar with me at the moment, but I am very passionate about both internal and external communication. I've spent the better part of the last three weeks meeting with everyone, staff, external stakeholders. I'm up to Queensland, over to Sydney, getting out and about. I was down at Sandown. I was up at Targa for um, the Mount Buller. Really want to get out there, and I'm encouraging our staff, CAMS members in CAMS tops, to get out to events and clubs and motor carners. So we will be certainly lifting the rating. There's no doubt that uh, CAMS in 2013, as it turns out, it's our 60th anniversary, so it gives us another reason to be out there. But you'll find that we'll certainly be lifting our rating in both internal and external, via the web, via our newsletters, but also with media in generally, and trying to get motorsport away from you know eight pages in to a little bit closer to the to the back of the uh, of the newspapers as it currently doesn't seem to get as much airplane unless it's v8s or f1 so that is a key strategic element for us and we're going to be pursuing that pretty hard that's one of the interesting things about this job that is very different from your role at both North Melbourne and Collingwood is that it's a very broad church. Your CAMS is responsible for everything from the Australian Formula One Grand Prix, which is the very pinnacle of international sport, all the way through to a motor car or a Daniloquin. How do you cover all of those areas and how do you make those uh, those people at Daniloquin feel as loved and as wanted as, the, as Bernie Eccleston and his friends at the Grand Prix? I actually believe we should be giving them more love at the, we'll call it the bottom end, that's not fair to them, but 95% of our members are people who go to the Daniloquin or the outer regional areas and local suburban areas around Melbourne, Sydney, all the other states. I think we have to really start with them. Rather than work our way down, we should be working our way up. So you'll find a pretty key, a pretty a strong element of our strategy will be to get out and about, talk to the clubs. We're not just um, there for insurance purposes. We need to be there for, for more than just insurance purposes and running events. So I think you'll see the proof in the pudding over the next six to 12 months that uh, we'll lift our rating in terms of communicating with clubs, improving that, that sort of interaction, and it'll come from the CEO down. It's not going to be something I'm going to entrust to uh, anyone and everyone. We are going to have a strategy to do that properly. And uh, again, I would think that within 12 months, people will be coming back and saying, we now know what CAMS does, and that's a great start. So how much sort of autonomy do you have as CEO of CAMS? Is it a matter of, I suppose, who do you who do you work for? Is it are you directly responsible to the board or to the members? Um, I, I see it as a dual role. I, I'm answerable to the board, but I'm equally answerable to the members. At the end of the day, uh, the board is the organisation that's appointed me. I'm responsible to them. They set KPIs. But in real terms, I'm a membership man, and that's how it should be seen. And uh, my success is probably going to be more judged by the interaction I have with members than necessarily reporting back to the board. I want to hear what I'm doing about the membership. So it's a bit of a 50-50 split, but I am very passionate about membership-based organisations, as you know, from my past. And that's something that I value enormously because I've been a member 
at a footy club. And I know some of the frustrations you can have in a lack of communication or a perception that you're not responding with customer service. All of those things are, are, are what are going to drive me um, while I'm here as CEO of this, of this organisation. So how do you use the, the popularity of things like the Australian Grand Prix and V8 supercars to promote that grassroots level. I mean, that's one of the criticisms that has come over the years. Is if, if you go out to the state rounds or any of these sort of grassroots or club sprints or any of these things, they will say V8 supercars are sucking us dry. V8 supercars have taken all the available sponsorship. Now, that's the commercial reality of it, but is there some way that those that, that top end can give back to the grassroots roots in terms of promoting it and supporting it? I think they can. But at the end of the day, it's like any other sport. When you ask an eight-year-old footballer where he wants to go, he'll want to be in a grand final team uh, holding a premiership. That's F1 or alternatively the V8s. But they have to come up through the ranks, whether it's Auskick and junior footy and then through the ordinary leagues around the country. We should be promoting that also. Yeah, we've got the V8s and the F1s as the upper echelon, but they are, to a large degree, dependent upon what, what lies below. And I use that word sort of metaphorically. The reality is that um, th that is the ultimate and there's lots of opportunities between joining as a 10-year-old in a car club all the way to the top. And that's another thing we're passionate about is development of young um, drivers, female and male, uh, and also engaging with females more than we have in the past. So there's a, a whole raft of opportunities that we can follow up. And at the moment, it sounds very familiar to what you've heard from previous CEOs. I'm sure that I've seen other strategy documents that are similar sort of things. Um, my record will stand or fall on what I do or what this administration will do in that area. So, um, yeah, uh, I, I think we should get more access to V8 drivers. Um, we should get more access to international drivers. But the reality is um, we should use that at least to leverage engagement at the lower levels. So have you got a time frame for your uh, time here at, uh, at CAMS? Uh, is there a sort of a five-year plan, a three-year plan? When do you decide to turn around and say, yes, it's worked, no, it hasn't? Oh, I'm very impatient. For me, it should have happened yesterday. The reality is that uh, we have to construct the structures in this. We have to make sure the structures in this organisation are ready and able to deliver. And that's my first challenge. I'm doing a review of the organisation so that I can feel confident that if we are going to go out and engage with members, we're actually not going to get lost in the, in the sort of the bureaucracy, if you want to call it that. So I'm learning everything I can about state council, state executives, the panels, the historics, everything that makes up this wonderful organisation to then work out how best to achieve our strategies. But you can't put a timeline. It's like a football club with young players. Don't, don't have any limit on your expectations. But I would think you'll start to see some results within the next six to nine months in a real sense and say, uh, I reckon they're, they're on the right track. Uh, I think we have been on the right track. We just need to actually um, get moving a little bit further down that track. In Pit Lane's always been a program that's more about the people who take part in motorsport more than as much as it is about the people who watch motorsport. A lot of racing drivers, a lot of flaggies, a lot of officials are watching this program tonight. What would you like to say directly to them? Um, in particular, uh, the volunteers. I think that this is a remarkable industry where we rely so heavily on the volunteers that they're probably underappreciated. Uh, that is something, again, that I'm pretty passionate about, recognising those flaggies and those people who give up their weekends sometimes travel from interstate at their own cost, put up their own accommodation to help CAMS achieve what it does, they will not be forgotten in all this. So we'll have our members through the car clubs and we'll obviously have our competitors who are licensees, but I'm particularly mindful of the work the volunteers do and the wonderful work they do, whether they're on committees, whether they're out at the tracks. So I just want to give them the confidence that I'm listening, I'm learning, and I intend to make things um, certainly better for CAMS members and CAMS competitors, officials, licensees, um, even our tracks and our permit, our perm, the events that we perm, obviously permit, everything at every level we're going to review to make sure that people turn around and say they get it. Because, as I said, we are motorsport in one form or another. Uh, we just need to make sure that people understand our role and how committed we are to making sure that that works to the best, to the betterment of everyone. Well, best of luck from, from all of us, I'm sure all of the viewers on in pit lane and certainly from, from the people who make the program, we're, we're very keen to see how it goes over the next few years. As you say, we've gone through quite a few CEOs over the years of our program, so uh, best of luck with the, what is going to be a real challenge ahead. Um, look forward to perhaps catching up with you live in the studio perhaps sometime next year and see how we're, everything's progressing. But for now, Eugene Rocker, thanks for joining us in pit lane. Thanks very much and I look forward to your support too. Thank you. Why should you get your car tuned with a Dynotech Dyno? 
Your car will be more fuel efficient. An accurate tune means saving money at the pump. Your car is safe. It never has to leave the workshop to be tested. Increased performance. Optimise fuel consumption and more power. Reduced emissions. Protect the environment by minimising your carbon footprint. To find your nearest Dynotech workshop, go to www.dino.com.au. Dynotech by Dino Dynamics.